Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Brad Eden, Director of Scarly Connections and co-chair of the Scarly Communications Working Group here in the Drexel University Libraries. Open Access Week is a global event promoting access to knowledge, highlighting open activities, and promoting actions that will help make more scholarly, scholarly and educational materials freely available to teachers, learners, researchers, and the public. Today, we welcome Dr. Lonnie Tapp, who is an Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Biostatistics in the Dornsife School of Public Health. Since joining the faculty at Drexel, her research focuses primarily on spatial statistics and epidemiology with applications in health and social disparities, violence, and toxicity studies. Much of Dr. Tabb's work involves using Bayesian statistical methods in the presence of complex data structures. Dr. Tabb's presentation today is entitled Cardiovascular Health Inequities, Innovative Methods Coupled with Diverse Observational Cohorts equals a recipe for evidence-based policies, which is scheduled for publication in the journal Spatial and Spatiotemporal Epidemiology. Dr. Tab will speak, will speak for 20 minutes, followed by 10 minutes for questions. For those of you who are virtual, please send your questions to me privately in the chat during the presentation. And as time permits, we will allow for any additional questions after the presentation. Without further ado, Dr. Tab. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you uh, for Drexel University Libraries for allowing us all to convene and to share knowledge. Um, and so I want to begin by first just giving a little bit of background before diving right into um, the paper that um, has since been accepted and it's now ready for um, access. And so a little bit of background about what I am often engaged in with respect to my research. It deals with this intersection and this interplay of health and place and time, but specifically health inequities. And so spatial heterogeneity, sometimes it's referred to as spatial patterning. Sometimes it's referred to as clustering or hotspots, but they're all gauging at the same thing, the importance of location. And so whether you're talking about overall mortality or life expectancy, um, I tend to focus on cardiovascular health because cardiovascular disease is one of the number one killers in this country, unfortunately. And so when we think about cardiovascular health, we have pockets of the country where unfortunately there are increased incidences of stroke. There is what's called the stroke belt within this country in the Southeastern part of the US. There's even a stroke buckle where things are worse, and that's along the Carolinas. There's what's also called the diabetes belt in terms of locations in this country where unfortunately incidents of stroke and or diabetes are at an all-time high. And so there could be different driving factors um, with respect to why this is the case. There could be spatial differences in the actual levels of the health risk factors, but then also, spatial differences or geographic differences in those health risk factors and how they are impacting health outcomes themselves. And so again, when we look at this intersection, it's space, it's health. And I put time here too, because um, we can't ignore the temporal nature of how things are changing in this country as well. And all of this tends to drive policies and interventions. And so for cardiovascular health, I tend to focus on Life Simple 7. It's actually called Life's Essential 8 now because it also includes sleep. But there are seven metrics that the American Heart Association says we need to pay attention to um, at an individual level to improve our cardiovascular health outcomes. So controlling our cholesterol, eating better, losing weight, getting physically active, managing blood pressure, reducing blood sugar, and also stop smoking. So these are seven metrics that we can actually use at the individual level to see how are we um, with respect to our own cardiovascular health. And so there are two papers that I've since published and I'm highlighting both, although one Drexel University was able to apply the funds for the um, open access. Um, the first one up here focused on purely looking at exploring this geographic patterning with respect to cardiovascular health in a cohort called the guards. And I'll go into more detail about that. Um, but the, the second one is the one that was just released this year. And so now it's open access, um, spatially varying racial inequities in cardiovascular health. 
So let me dive right in. Um, the goal of this study was to examine the extent to which different social determinants of health, and not just at the individual level, but also at the neighborhood level, how they explain the racial differences in um, cardiovascular health, as well as the geographic pattern that exists. And so luckily I was able to um, collaborate with um, other researchers that utilize observational cohort data that is funded um, and supported by the National Institutes of Health. And so this one study in particular, the REGARD study, the REGARD study has followed participants across the United States, over 30,000 black and white residents across this country and they're representative in every state in the contiguous US. And so although I did start off with 30,239 participants in that study because of various missing data and not being able to have access to all the information that I needed, it was just shy of about 18,000 participants in the study, but still representative of every state within the US. And so in terms of the regards study and, and how I actually measured the different outcomes, the different individual level factors, neighborhood level factors. First, the primary focus here was focusing on the cardiovascular health score. So every participant in the study had a score that was a function of all of these things that the American Heart Association says we need to care about. And so they are broken up into two different types of cardiovascular health components. There are health behaviors. Those are a function of things like your smoking habits, your eating habits, your physical activity and your weight. But then the other health factors, these are more biological metrics. So glucose measures, cholesterol, and also blood pressure. And so the, the total cardiovascular health score itself, um, it's a range. And so the higher the score that each participant has, the, the better, the more ideal their cardiovascular health. And then I also, in, in a secondary analysis, I did look at total health behavior scores. So just focus on these modifiable things and then also health factor scores just focused on the biological. At the individual level, the things that typically are known to predict things like cardiovascular health, um, it's often you know, the age of participants, the sex of participants, the race, the education, marital status, income, these are all individual level metrics that have been shown to have an impact on predicting cardiovascular health. At the neighborhood level, this is work that has been um, increasingly um, becoming more and more um, well known to be able to say, not only do we have to focus on the individual level metrics, but we need to focus on where people live and what types of things are they exposed to in their environments. And so the neighborhood here for each participant in the regard study was based off of what census tract they lived in. And then there were different ways to be able to um, characterize a neighborhood. I characterize neighborhoods based off of residential segregation metrics. I characterize neighborhoods based off of things in terms of like how walkable a neighborhood is, the physical activity spaces that are there. So what gyms and tennis courts and, you know, walking paths are available. Favorable food stores is something that has a huge implication in terms of how people are um, at the individual level making choices, right, in terms of what they eat. And then also social engagement. All of these metrics tend to have severe implications, which could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what is absent or present in a neighborhood and how it's going to predict outcomes. The index of concentration at the extremes, this is the one residential segregation measure that I did utilize. And what this measure does is it doesn't just necessarily count up the number of people that live in a neighborhood based on a certain race or ethnicity. Um, unfortunately, in this country, when we think about residential segregation, oftentimes we can get very siloed in terms of how we think about residential segregation. But residential segregation as a function of things like race, ethnicity in combination with income is really what's important to be able to truly characterize how segregation can then negatively impact us on an individual level basis, as well as at a neighborhood level. The physical activity spaces, I kind of mentioned briefly, but this was a function of things like gyms and YMCAs. The favorable, I'm sorry, the walkability uh, metric, this walkability metric takes into account how densely populated neighborhoods are, but then it also takes into account 
um, rail, trip, rail train stop density, um, as well as destination density, because the more that you have in terms of access to different destinations, the likelihood of people walking and being able to move about in their space increases. Favorable food stores, um, food stores that offer fresh fruits and vegetables, food stores that um, offer these more healthy options. These types of environments are going to allow people to make better judgments with respect to how they are, um, you know, actually paying close attention to their diet. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that just because you place a Wegmans in a neighborhood that everyone in that neighborhood is going to be able to access said, Weg said Wegmans. Um, but it is important to be able to capture this type of information at a neighborhood level so that you understand the context that people have. And then the social engagement metric, there are tons of different ways that you can take into account how socially connected people are. Um, and I've listed just a few here from like spas and libraries. Um, and, and the reason why this is here is because there, there's a ton of evidence and research that points to how socially connected people are in a neighborhood and how that tends to improve overall health, right? So not just cardiovascular health, but overall health as well. So in terms of the actual analyses, um, there were a bunch of different types of statistical methods that I had to utilize because I wanted to make sure that the inference that I was drawing um, that they were as holistic as possible. So it ran the gamut from starting off with exploratory um, and descriptive statistics all the way to more complex spatial modeling that takes into account not just how these individual and neighborhood level factors impact cardiovascular health, but taking into account that people who live in a certain neighborhood, if they're surrounded by other neighborhoods that tend to have these similar characteristics, that maybe there's some correlation there in terms of how those people are operating versus in other pockets of the country. So these are just a few of the selected findings that you will be able to find in the actual paper itself. Um, what I like to do um, is when I am showing statistics, I realize that um, as much as I like to see tables and numbers on a day-to-day -day basis, and I do this in my sleep as well, um, not everyone would, would um, favor just looking at numbers, right? And so I, I think that it's really important to be able to show in other map-based ways um, what's going on with respect to the disparities that exist, right? And so here, this map is actually showing that the Black-white differences that we observed in cardiovascular health tended to be bigger or smaller, depending on what pockets of the country you're looking at. And so the darker the red shade, the wider the black-white disparities were. And even though in pockets of the country, like the stroke belt that tends to be down here in the southeastern part of the US, um, you, you see that there are other pockets of the country where up in the Northeast, um, you see larger disparities existing. And so oftentimes when we think about disparities and we think about measuring these differences between people, whether it's based on race, ethnicity, or even based on other ways, um, oftentimes we tend to think globally that they just exist. But this map is allowing us to actually see, well, where and how bad is it, right? Because then we're able to then uh, prioritize interventions and policies. So we're more informed in terms of how we're targeting. So these are some additional maps um, from the paper as well, but this one is not just focused on the total cardiovascular health score, but it was looking at um, taking into account um, the, the behavioral and also the biological. So in terms of, you know, once, <laughs> once this research is complete, it's a matter of, well, what, what next, right? Like once we have this evidence to show that depending on different pockets of the country, the cardiovascular health, black-white differences are larger or smaller in, in, in these different pockets. Um, it allows us to produce the evidence that's necessary to have these more informed ways to create policies and interventions. So efforts to improve cardiovascular health and also reduce these types of disparities, it's not just going to require a, a global approach at trying to address these disparities, but a more geographically based, culturally competent way of addressing the iniquities themselves. 
Um, and I pointed out in those maps before that even though we have pockets of the country like the stroke belt or the stroke buckle or even the diabetes belt, these are well-known areas in this country where we target policies and we target interventions. But if we focus also more broadly on all of the US, we notice that there is evidence of showing um, significant disparities outside of these pockets of the country. And so we need to be able to take a really, um, a really geographically based way, a geographically based approach at trying to develop these types of interventions and policies. Um, neighborhoods matter. And so a lot of the work um, that I've been engaged in over, I would say most of my career, not just focusing on this most recent, this most recent publication, um, but a lot of the work that I have been engaged in over the years focuses on not just at the individual level, but how individual and neighborhood level factors are impacting individuals' health outcomes. Um, the drive here, I've touched a bit already about how more informed evidence-based policies need this type of research and need this, these types of results. Um, and in terms of the timing of it all, uh, the REGARD study is a study that has been in existence for almost two decades now. And so while the work that I have been engaged in, um, you know, focuses on a snapshot in time for those participants, uh, my future work is taking into account this temporal nature of how the disparities may have shifted over time. Um, unfortunately, there's evidence that shows that in certain pockets of the country, disparities are widening and not shrinking. And so the time component is really necessary. Um, and then the one last thing that I'll mention with respect to you know, this like now what component, um, I focused on looking at things like residential segregation because those are systematic ways of us being able to address things at the neighborhood level. Residential segregation though, um, it's not a proxy necessarily for racism, right? It's a proxy for how people are separated that live in a particular neighborhood. Structural racism, however, can live in and of itself, in and of itself, but we have to have better ways of being able to identify if that is also the culprit in trying to figure out where these disparities exist and how they're looking over time. So I want to just give a few acknowledgments um, for, for this work. Um, Leslie McClure, um, who is the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics Chair here at Drexel, was a collaborator of mine. Um, Ana Diaz-Rue, who is the Dean of the Northside School of Public Health, Sherelle Barber, Gina Lavasi, who are both epidemiologists within the school. Um, there are um, additional research team members that are external to the university that I've listed here and also to the regards participants. These participants who have, like I said, they've, they've been in this cohort for um, a significant period of time um, and without participants raising their hand to volunteer in the name of science, I'm not able to, um, to, to actually do this type of research. And then, of course, the funding, I'd like to point out, and in particular, the open access funding that um, has allowed me to be able to, to share this information, um, not just with, because it, this article was published in Spatial and Spatial Temporal Statistics, Statistical Epidemiology. It's a journal that, um, yes, the audience is statisticians, biostatisticians, and epidemiologists, um, but also policy members and health professionals. But unfortunately, being able to access this type of information is not always easy. And so I'm grateful for the funding to be able to make, the, uh, make that jump for it to, to now live in this open access space. Any questions? Yeah, so... I may have misunderstood the map I was looking at, but Maine jumped out at me. Yes. And I was wondering <laughs> if you had any thoughts as to why that yeah. level of disparity in, in Maine of all places. No, you didn't you didn't miss that that, that, that. Yeah. but that's why I do what I do, because I think that, you know, it's it's really important to think of the context in terms of what we're seeing. Right. And so her question is, you know, around why is Maine exhibiting like the largest disparities? And so I'll give you a little bit of backdrop on regards as well. 
the regards cohort was actually oversampled in the southeast. And that's because that's because of the stroke belt and the diabetes belt. So they wanted to oversample participants in the south there. And they also wanted to oversample black participants um, living in the south. And so with the regard sample, it is roughly 50-50 with respect to black and white participants, which I cannot take, we we all can't take that for granted because oftentimes with some of these like observational cohort studies, you don't always have equal representation for different racial or ethnic groups. And so even though um, there are fewer um, black regards participants that actually live in the Northeast in comparison to the Southeast, we're still able to pick up on these big differences. Um, and the one thing that I will say is that out of all of these neighborhood let me go back. All of these neighborhood level measures that I considered, um, and I've considered them not just because I picked them out of a hat, but because these have like, you know, tried and true relationships with predicting cardiovascular health related outcomes in other studies outside of regards. None of these mattered as much, but what did matter was the residential segregation. The residential segregation that operates in Maine looks very different than residential segregation that may operate in other pockets of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and so I say all this to say, not that these don't matter. Statistically, they did not come out at that level of significance that would make me think like, oh, this is the problem that, you know, walkability and, you know, access to, to favorable foods or healthy foods. That's not necessarily what's coming up to the top, but what is coming up to the top is the residential segregation. And so um, I think that that's something that needs to be considered more, um, not more so than some of these other structural ways that neighborhoods are made up of, but if we ignore things like residential segregation, then we might actually miss some of these huge disparities that might exist in different pockets of the country outside of the places that we already kind of hypothesized that things might be bad. Yes. I have a question about um, the neighborhood. Um, so you said your neighborhood is census tract level, but the map that you showed was, I think it was state, state level. So I was curious, uh, what was your motivation to show the state level? Data? Yeah, so the question is, um, you know, how we define a neighborhood for participants in the study, it is based on their census tract. Um, but then in some of the results, I showed things at the state level. So that was twofold. At the neighborhood level, I wanted to know their access and how they are operating within their actual neighborhoods. Now, mind you, most people don't necessarily make decisions on them wanting to live on a certain census tract. People make decisions based off of, I want to live in West Philly because I want to be able to, you know, be close to Fairmont Park. I want to be able to be close to the zoo. People make decisions based on um, actual contextual ways of neighborhoods. However, when you characterize neighborhoods based on census tracts, we're able to then characterize neighborhoods at a more granular level to then speak at things like this, like the healthy food stores, um, the physical activity resources. The state level map that I did show, this state level map is allowing me to, even though yes, we have participants that are nested within census tracts within each state, I'm able to aggregate up to be able to see at the state level, how bad are these disparities? And the reason why I did that is because a lot of times, aside from the local legislation that happens, right, um, state level policies also matter. And so in some of my future work, I have interest in looking at state level policy implications um, and how they may or may not be contributing to the disparities that we see at this state level. So I did, I had to, these are, these are actually random effects that are representative from the, from the modeling that I set up. Any other, yes. I'm curious, is your focus been largely on urban neighborhoods or because I'm curious the urban versus rural yeah. differences since some of the walkability looks very different in That's those right. different contexts. That's right, that's a great question. So um, for those of you online who may not have heard, the question revolves around looking, you know, did I take into consideration um, rural versus urban? Um, and so the thing about the regards participants, although they are sampled and yes, they come from every state, 
some are coming from more rural environments versus urban. And so in all of my models, I do have a population density metric to be able to control for those types of differences. Um, but you're right. Um, it's not the same for walkability in, say, you know, Forsyth County, South Carolina versus New York City. Um, but the, the population density metrics that I use adjust for that. Any other questions? Yes. I was wondering if you have any more um, data on like just specific specific neighborhoods. So for instance, this zip code 19104, which you know has the universities and yeah. I know it has a, a mixed population because of the college students, but also many of the employees living and working in the neighborhood as well. Um, how that really uh, differs from other areas that doesn't have a university or, you know, that doesn't yeah. have a, a huge younger population as right. well. No, that's a great question. Um, so for those of you online, if you didn't hear, the question was, um, ha was, was I able to actually look at how neighborhoods are characterized other ways? So like, for instance, here in Philadelphia, we know that this particular zip code, it's a mixed um, type of zip code with like younger populations, you have universities, so in the analyses, I did not take into consideration those other types of ways in terms of like whether it's businesses or retail, other, other, other ways of characterizing a neighborhood. But I do recognize um, that there are going to be differences. I do recognize that. And some of my other um, studies that I have utilized um, observational data, um, there are other neighborhood measures that you can create to be able to then say, you know, is it, and it all depends on your actual outcome too. So like for instance, cardiovascular health um, and, and, you know, things like say, for instance, premature mortality, that's gonna look different in a city like Philadelphia versus a retirement community in Florida, right? Um, and so, um, but there are different ways, there are different metrics that can be, that can be utilized. So you emphasize the temporal aspect of studies like this. What is this a certain time period that is this map, or um, mm -hmm. like is it now? Or yeah. So the question was, um, what is the temporal aspect here? So for the regard study, this was all based on baseline, and so it was early two thousand. So the work that I am attempting to engage in now that adds in the temporal will take me from the, the baseline of this all the way until probably not as close as like COVID times, but right before COVID. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. There's one. I don't have any online, so. Actually, I do. It, it's kind of a follow up in a way to the question I asked before about Maine. Mm -hmm. So, little Georgia there, um, what are they doing right? Because they seem to be right in the middle of an area. I know. <laughs> it's, it's interesting you bring up that. Um, so, when, when we looked at where participants lived, because even though this is a simplified map and it's just state level, um, we were able to actually see um, with some random noise added where participants actually live. Um, Atlanta is a huge um, hotspot um, for, it's a huge metro area um, and also tends to have better health outcomes. Um, and so that's likely the driving factor there because more people who participated in the study are coming from like that, like metro area. Oh, yeah. Wondered about that. Yeah. All right, well, let's give a round of applause to Dr. Tam. Thank you everyone who came and have also attended virtually.